decommissioning infrastructure uh, and decommissioning infrastructure from former energy uses, uh, oil and gas, power stations and so on, industrial manufacture, transport, mining and waste. And that's all part of bringing land back into beneficial use uh, as part of a circular land use way of thinking about things. So the kind of things that we, we do and we operate uh, both in Europe and also in, in South America, I've done work in Brazil, uh, although my Portuguese is non-existent, it includes things like site characterization, risk assessment, remediation, permitting, licensing, scoping out what needs to be done and verifying that the work has been done properly. Happy to take questions on any of that uh, later on in the talk. That's me um, in Australia a couple of years ago at a conference, uh, taking part in what was broadcast as a radio interview. But you'll see that I'm holding a model of one of the chemicals that are part of that PFAS family, trying to explain to a radio audience the chemistry of quite a complicated molecule. I joined GHD as their technical director of contamination assessment and remediation last summer in the middle of the pandemic. And I've spent quite a long time being a, a university professor and running a small specialist contaminated land consultancy. And now I'm working for a company that's got 10 or 11,000 people. So a bit of a change. So let's go back to basics and, and remind us of the chemistry of carbon. Uh, carbon wants four electrons for the outer shell to be full to reach what I call chemical nirvana. And it does this by sharing four electrons through covalent bonding. And a good example in uh, text here is methane. Or down here, you see a chlorinated solvent. Oops, somebody's stolen my screen. I'm going to steal it back again, if I may. There we go. So down here we have two carbons, the two black atoms, sharing four electrons, two with chlorines and two with the other carbon atom. So that's the fundamental basis of organic chemistry. If I look at PFAS, per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances, in the middle, I have one of the alkanes, octane, which has eight carbons. And each carbon is bonded with either another carbon or two or three of these white hydrogens. So that's octane. On the left, you've still got these eight carbons. But instead of hydrogens, they are replaced with fluorine. And at one end, we have a different functional group. What makes PFAS interesting and challenging is the structure of that molecule. So this is PFOS, perfluorooctane sulfonic acid. And on the right, if I can just get the videos out of the way, you have perfluorooctanoic acid. So again, we have the eight carbons, but a different functional group at the end that makes this particular uh, substance a, uh, an organic acid. So PFOA and PFOS are the two famous substances in the PFAS family. But there are many others. And they are usually referred to by their acronyms. Some are four letter acronyms. Some are five letter acronyms. Now, the family of poly and perfluorinated alkyl substances runs to well over 5,000 individual chemicals. The latest number that uh, I'm aware of is something of the order of nine or 10,000. The problem we face is the laboratories can only analyze a small number of these chemicals. And the regulators don't have an agreed list of what their top priority 
PFAS molecules might be. PFOS and PFOA, the two chemicals we've just looked at, are the top two, and they are generally recognized everywhere. But then after that, the competition for regulatory attention is quite hot and it differs from country to country. The chemistry, and we'll look at that later on, of these chemicals means that they dissolve in water. The carbon fluorine bond is very strong, so they are very difficult to break down. If we are exposed to them, they will accumulate in us. They are known to be harmful to human health and wildlife. And the regulators are taking an increasing focus or giving an increasing focus to these substances around the world. And we're seeing week by week, month by month, different regulators coming up with their own standards. And I'll talk about some of the European ones uh, later on. If they are the poly form, so that's where they don't have all the hydrogens replaced by um, fluorine, then in the environment, then they can change in the environment through natural reaction. And the other thing to realize is that there is a trend of water quality standards getting stricter and stricter and stricter over time. They are generally considered as one of a family of contaminants that are considered to be emerging contaminants. They're not the only emerging contaminant, but they are probably the most famous one at the moment with usually a link to 1,4-dioxane as well. Now, what is an emerging contaminant? The US Environmental Protection Agency talks about them as chemicals that haven't been detected or are being detected at levels that are very different from what was expected. The risks to human health are um, not necessarily understood or well enough known. Elsewhere in the States, these are chemicals that have the ability to enter the environment and potentially threaten human health or the environment. And we don't know very much about them. There aren't, there aren't, there isn't much in the way of a peer reviewed uh, literature on human health standards or standards are changing. They're evolving very quickly because of new standards, better abilities in the laboratory to detect the chemicals or new exposure pathways. They are not new. So on the next slide, I'll see why do we have emerging contaminants, but perhaps we didn't look in the past. Now in the 1980s, very famous case where the most important groundwater in England was polluted with chlorinated solvents, uh, went to the highest court in the country and the reason that the lords, the, the senior judges gave for not allocating liability was because the consequences could not be foreseen. Perhaps we looked and didn't find them. We're getting very good these days at finding very low levels of things like asbestos fibers. Or it might be that the epistemology, our understanding is getting better. And we'll look at what that means for the laboratories. So if we have emerging contaminants like the PFAS, well, why have they suddenly emerged from Pandora's box, if you know your Greek mythology? Well, we, we may not have looked. We didn't think to test for them. We didn't have the ability to test for them. Maybe in some places, the contaminant just wasn't there anyway. Maybe our analytical capabilities weren't good enough and we could not detect it. And then maybe, and these chemicals have been around for decades, maybe others looked and found it and we chose to bury our heads in the sand and pretend it isn't there. So in the context of risk management, what does that mean? Well, ultimately, it involves an evaluation of those risks that boils down to a decision on whether or not to take some action. 
And I, I thought that I would recognize the fact that I'm giving this talk during the middle of a pandemic. Um, we are slowly emerging from it. But this is uh, a, a document produced by the British National Audit Office about the National Health Service and the um, management of risk by the health service. And what's interesting is if they, if you look at how the audit office defines risk assessment, those of you who work in contaminated land as risk assessment will understand this process. It's about identifying the hazards. What chemicals do we have? And then assessing how likely these hazards are to be able to harm people in a hospital context, workers and others. And then the evaluation is this decision. Do I do something or don't? So risk assessment and risk management are concepts that are applied in many different domains, including the management of pandemics. But in the land contamination context, risk-based land management are a concept that emerged um, really in the 1990s across Europe through the work of European networks like Caracas, the Concerted Action on Risk Assessment of Contaminated Sites, uh, the follow-on work from Clarinet, Cabernet, the network that I was involved in, Nicole, and so on. So risk management involves a process, a systematic process of identifying and the unacceptable risks and then eliminating or controlling them and doing that in a safe and timely manner. Now, this definition is taken from ISO 18504, which deals with sustainable remediation. And the ISO goes on to require the optimization of environmental, social, and economic aspects of the remediation work. And I led the working group that wrote that international standard with colleagues from across Europe, from Japan, from Australia, and input from colleagues from North America, from the USA and from Canada. The process begins with investigating the site, assessing the risks, deciding whether or not those risks need dealing with. And if they do, you've then got to decide how to remediate. And that's where the international standard comes in. And then you get out and do it, you remediate the land, prove that it's worked, you do your verification, and then you've got land that you can redevelop. And in the UK, we have new guidance that came out last year from the Environment Agency called Land Contamination Risk Management that tells developers, landowners, and so on, what they need to do at each of those stages. And PFAS fits into that very, very well. So the PFAS problem is that these chemicals, their properties that made them useful, their ability to help us fight certain types of fires, their ability to repel water, their ability to help in a variety of industries, also made them mobile, bioaccumulative, persistent in the environment, and we now know that they are toxic as well. So they pose a risk to human health. We've got these stricter regulation levels. Analytical capabilities are getting better all the time. And they are difficult to remediate. They're difficult to remove from water. Now, I did look at the abstract volume that we were sent for this conference. And there are 40 mentions of PFAS. But I then realized that they were all from two abstracts, my own and another paper on PFAS. So it seems that we haven't quite um, allowed this event to be overtaken by PFAS, which is good. Taking no action, doing nothing, is not a good course of action because of the mobility of these chemicals. They will spread, they will pollute more water, they will reduce land values more. So doing nothing is not wise. But equally, we don't necessarily have a once and for all solution today. So a middle ground, a Goldilocks solution 
is needed. Wise management that controls the problem over the long term. Now that might seem like a Herculean task, and I'll come back to Hercules in just a second. But the solution to that challenge today is replacing PFAS from products. And that's already in train, that's already underway. Isolating the source areas so that we stop the problem getting bigger. Containing the plumes at the boundary, and we're getting better at doing that. Destruction of the molecules is a challenge. It can be done under controlled conditions in small volumes, but doing it at large scale is difficult. And I've got a slide on that towards the end. But in the meantime, you need to make sure that the people who are exposed to these chemicals, often through drinking water, are being protected. And for example, in Australia, that's meant providing people with um, bottled water supply because their wells in their homes could not be used. Doing nothing, as I said, business as usual is not an option. Before you can do anything about a problem, you need to understand it. And I am a big fan of my six friends here, when, where, what, when, how, why, and who. Let me see if I can clear my screen. There we go. So we need to understand where the PFAS is. Is it in the soil? Is it in the groundwater? Is it present as a separate phase or is it dissolved? What individual chemicals are present? When were they spilt, deposited, disposed of? And that's important for two reasons. One of which is it gives us an idea of how much time they've had to spread. And the other one is in the last question. How did they get there? Is there a leaking pipe? Were they deposited as waste? And why are they there? Were they put there deliberately, perhaps with permission? Was there an accident? Were they a byproduct of something else? And you can begin to see the regulators beginning to get interested in these questions now. And ultimately, who put them there? Who allowed them to be put there? Who gave the permissions or the licenses? Because with these, responsibility and liability follows. So once you've understood the problem, you've then got a chance of coming up with a solution. You've now understood where the PFAS is. You've understood where the problem is. You begin to get a handle on how to either deal with the source or interrupt the pathway or otherwise protect the receptor. We need a definition of when the risks are no longer unacceptable under the particular legislation, the particular law that you're working under. And this is where the regulatory standards come into their own. How can they be managed? So as a responsible landowner, Perhaps it's a company that has uh, come to the end of the use it has for a particular facility. So it's in the process of decommissioning and demolishing with an intention to reuse the land. How can those risks be managed in an efficient, socially responsible and environmentally acceptable way? And if we have an understanding of why the risks are unacceptable, then we can address that issue through our risk management. And then the final question is, who is going to do all this? Or more importantly, who's going to pay for it to be done? So who, where does the responsibility lie? Again, those six questions, where, what, when, how, why, and who come into their own. So I'm gonna look now across Europe, and it's not a comprehensive review of what is going on with regulatory standards across Europe? Uh, Solver down here is a European uh, co-funding initiative 
that emerged out of an EU Horizon 2020 project called Inspiration that I was involved in. And so there is trying to move forward with implementing some of the, uh, the research and development ideas that came out of Inspiration. And their, their first initiative is looking at PFAS. So these are quotes from the, the Soil Vare Summary, a really good workshop back in uh, November, December of last year, where we discussed PFAS and risk-based approaches. And I'd encourage you to look at the Soil Vare website for a bit more information. Now, at the turn of the year, the, uh, a revised drinking water directive came into effect across the 27 member states of the European Union. It introduced limits for some individual PFAS and for total PFAS. Uh, it did a number of other things as well that talked about endocrine disruptors, microplastics, but we're only looking at PFAS today. So we now have across the European Union, the 27 member states have two years to transpose this new drinking water directive into their national legislation, and then it comes into force. So the limits are 0.1 microgram per litre for the total of 20 individual chemicals and a level of 0.5 micrograms per litre for total PFAS concentration. But there isn't at the moment a means of measuring total PFAS. So this will only kick in once we know how to measure total PFAS. So that's at a European level. Uh, the UK, the Drinking Water Inspectorate, set limits for just two of the chemicals, PFOA and PFOS, of 0.01 micrograms per litre. Now that seems really low, but if you realise that the European level of 0.1 is for 20 chemicals, you're beginning to see that they're not very different in practice. In the Netherlands, uh, RIVM has uh, looked at developing a way of um, assessing PFAS, and we'll look at those in a minute. But this is where I return to Hercules and the um, Heracles problem uh, project. So the Greek for Hercules is Heracles and some work by Frank Svarches, who some of you may have heard speaking earlier on today, a few years ago, tried to create a framework for consistency in risk assessment tools um, that ultimately made some really good progress, but didn't achieve consistency across everything. And I was very pleased to be part of the team working with Frank on that project. But again, uh, because we're seeing that PFAS is a problem that is common across Europe and South America and North America and Australia, a degree of collaboration is much, much more likely to pay dividends, to give us answers uh, than each country doing its own thing. Looking at a part of Belgium, the Flemish part where OVAM has uh, again in the last uh, year or so published guideline values for soil and groundwater, looking at the range of different approaches. So here we're looking at soil for PFOS, and we can see um, a variety of different toxicological values from the EPA and others, and the uh, recognition of a background value of, uh, of PFOS. And then the same thing down here for PFOA in soil, and then over here, for groundwater, for PFOS and PFOA. Now these units are again um, very low. These are nanograms per liter, and we can see values of toxicological interest here, of uh, oral exposure of 120 nanograms uh, per liter coming in there. So we're beginning to see a range of um, values there, uh, and then here we see the soil remediation values for soil and for groundwater, um, let's look at the residential one, a value of 89 micrograms 
per kilogram coming into play there. And as the land use gets less sensitive, the numbers go up. Now, the problem with mixtures is, and the, the inability to analyze for individual contaminants means that we've got to come up with other ways of making a decision. And RIVM have been exploring a, an approach looking at relative potency factors similar to those that we have, might be familiar with for polyaromatic hydrocarbons, uh, dioxins, dioxin-like PCBs, where you look at the uh, predicting the overall effect of exposure to a mixture by looking at potency relative to an index compound, in this case, such as PFOS, whereas with PAH as it might be with respect to benzoapyrene. And there's a number of initiatives um, of these kind of relative potency factor approaches. EFSA, on the other hand, has decided to treat four substances, PFOS, PFOA, uh, PFNA, and PFHXS, to, uh, as being equally bad, equally potent, and give them a combined tolerable weekly intake. So relative potency factors, equipotency, all that presumes that we are able to test and sample and analyze in a consistent way, and that we are able to use, um, because the, the technology is developing all the time and the methods are developing, to use non-standardized, perhaps non-certified methods of analysis. But it's really important to document how things were done so that an evaluation can be made that you have got real concentrations and it's not just the consequence of contaminating your sample from something else. How was the sample taken? And did you use equipment that was known to be PFAS free? How did you prevent cross-contamination from one location to the other? How did you ensure your sample was protected from being taken to getting to the laboratory to being analyzed? What did the laboratory do in extracting the chemical from the soil matrix or the water matrix? How was it prepared? What form of analysis was carried out? And that allows you to decide just how confident you can be in the results. So we've recently been doing um, three projects, three different types of land uses, um, all of them we suspected there would be PFAS present and there was, but we made sure by testing blanks and samples that we thought should not have any PFAS in them to prove that where we got a reading, it was a genuine reading and not an issue with contamination. And then you need to feed, feed that information into something that will give you an estimate of the risk so that you can then do, then do your evaluation. And we'll look at some of the chemical methods. Now, the starting point with any risk assessment is the legal context, uh, and this is my UK or English legislation in one slide, but the important thing, wherever you're working, is to understand the legal context, because that will define what is an unacceptable risk and who is going to be responsible for paying for any remediation. Now, where do you begin to look? Where does that risk assessment process begin? Well, it begins at the desk study stage. This is guidance from 1995, and it's early stage guidance to the UK regulators on what contaminants to expect at different types of land use industries. And we see that for airports, there are lots of contaminants, aviation fuel, for example, but including amongst the fire agents, there is a warning to look out for fluorinated surfactants. Now, I've already told you that PFAS has fluorine in them. The shape of the molecule means that you end up with a polarized molecule. And that means that you end up with a surfactant. When eventually you get to have your dinner, you may do the washing up afterwards. The detergent that you use to clean your plates is a surfactant. So 26 years ago, 
standard guidance to UK regulators included a signpost to the family that we now know as PFAS. Caracas published some of the early thinking of um, risk-based approaches to contaminated land. Uh, Greenleaves 3 is the UK Department of the Environment guidance on environmental risk assessment. And the process, hopefully, is one that's quite familiar to you. What's the problem? Well, that's the legal context. Assess the risk, consider what you're going to do about it, do it, and make sure that you're managing the risk not the presence of a molecule. So assessing the risk means what are your hazards? How do they behave, their fate, their transport, their toxicity? How much risk do they actually pose given the land use that you've got? And then given the legal context, is that risk a significant one? Does the legislation require action to be taken? So we've got over 5,000 of these things. And how do we find them? Well, there's a range of, a growing range of chemical techniques that are listed down there. How do we assess them? Well, we're still working as a community around the world on understanding the dose response relationship that will help us identify either a no appreciable risk level or a minimal risk level if we have non threshold behavior. And different regulators across the world have adopted different safe levels for different individual or groups of substances. And we've seen already uh, approaches looking at individual chemicals, PFOS, uh, converting everything to a PFOS equivalent, or looking at mixtures of four from EFSA or 20 from uh, the European Commission's revised drinking water, a European Union's revised drinking water directive. And risk assessment from a human health point of view is quite simple. It's what's going in and what would be allowed. So what's the exposure and how much exposure is deemed to be safe? And we know how to do that um, for contaminants. We've got risk assessment tools to allow us to do that. We're beginning to get an idea that PFAS are everywhere. Uh, this is a study from a few years ago now looking at the presence of PFAS at airfields uh, sponsored by the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, and then there is a, a parallel project going on at the moment in England, again, similarly looking at what kind of industries do we have PFAS contamination of regulatory interest. About a year ago, a film called Dark Waters was released, and it's, it's now available on some of the online platforms, where a lawyer portrayed by Mark Ruffalo, the actor who played the Hulk in the Avengers series of films, if that's your thing, he plays the lawyer who uncovers the story of PFAS contamination from a landfill site that was affecting livestock and people's health. And I'd encourage you to perhaps watch the film, read the New York Times article that inspired the film, or perhaps even read the book that the, the real lawyer um, wrote about his decade-long, decades-long experience of working on this. Now, the importance of that story today is that as part of that court case, a panel was appointed to look at the links between exposure to PFOA and human health. And in the legal context of that particular case, a probable link was established between exposure to PFOA and high cholesterol, thyroid disease, a couple of cancers, and hypertension. The panel were three academics from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, from Brown University and Emory University. So we have a range of approaches to estimating risks, that ratio between exposure and allowable exposure. Um, if you take nothing else away from this talk, please recognize the value of really, really good preliminary 
risk assessment, qualitative risk assessments where you understand in a non-quantitative way where your contaminants are, the geology, the likely places where they might migrate to and so on. But when you've decided where the problems might be and you need some numbers, you need some chemical concentrations, there are a range of analyses that you might want to look at. Total organic fluorine, a variety of suites of individual substances. Um, there are um, tests that will tell you what the total potential concentration of the perfluorinated chemicals might be. So be very careful that you get concentrations in a form that you can use in a comparison against the toxicological guideline value from your regulator. Don't simply go to the laboratory and say, tell me what you've got there in terms of PFAS, because you won't necessarily get useful answers back in a risk assessment context. So the chemistry is really important. It drives the fate, transport and toxicity. And as a reminder, the family of chemicals we're looking at are soluble, they're mobile, they're bioaccumulative, they're persistent, and they are toxic. Now, I'm going to uh, thank Professor Ravi Nadu, Professor at the University of Newcastle in New South Wales and Chief Executive of the CRC Care in Australia. Uh, he gave a really good keynote at a a conference organized in December by the German uh, authorities, and, and that is now available online. But one of his slides gave us a, a list of potential destruction technology options and, and where we are with them um, in, uh, at, at the present time. So there's the whole range of techniques there, and you're not really seeing the standard remediation technologies that we might be familiar with in contaminated land remediation. Many of these are high energy, high cost, able to deal with small volumes at the moment. So the challenge is to make these scalable up to a, a scale where they can be used on a genuine post-industrial brownfield site, uh, an old oil refinery or um, a, a petrol state, uh, a power station or something like that. So there's a range of technologies out there but they are still in various stages of being mainstream and operational. There are, however, other technologies that will allow us to contain, manage the problem without necessarily breaking apart that, uh, that molecule that at its core has that really strong carbon fluorine bond. So all of that is about preparing us for a solution Emerging contaminants are a challenge, but they're not an intractable challenge. They are there needing to be responded to. And these are some thoughts about looking for solutions. Uh, whether you are a client or you're working for a client, what is their goal? What are they trying to do? Where are they trying to their, get their land to? What's possible? within the time, the space, the budget, and the current level of technological um, abilities. There is a real benefit in sharing knowledge, particularly at this stage in the, the worldwide understanding of the PFAS problem. So we often work with clients and say, at the end of all this, once we've finished it, please may we, with your permission, publish some of this work so others may benefit as well. Uh, as, a, as an advisor, as a consultant, uh, honesty is always a, a good policy. Um, and if you're doing something that might be innovative and therefore not necessarily proven, be open about that. Nothing wrong with it. Uh, indeed, how will we ever push the boundaries of our abilities if we don't do things that are untested? The regulators are working very hard to um, develop guidance and principles and ways of deciding when something is being done properly and when they need to intervene and force some action. So being open with them about what you know and what's not known about the uncertainties, again, helps them be confident that you're doing the job properly. And that concludes with, if you're a professional 
practitioner, whether you're an engineer, a geologist, a scientist, then making sure that you're working in accordance with the codes of practice that your profession requires. And that all together creates the right environment for coming up with risk-based solutions to a problem that we need to address, but we don't necessarily know how to break apart the molecules at a viable, reasonable um, expenditure of resources. So I think that's my penultimate slide uh, in front of me. Where have we got to? Well, we've recognized that PFAS as a family are a problem. We've begun to take them out of products. We, where we know where the source areas are, they can be isolated so they can't spread any further. There are increasingly good techniques to capture dissolved phased plumes to stop uh, the problem getting away from your site boundary and out of your control. There are moves towards being able to destroy contaminants, but that's still on the way. And at the same time, uh, we need, as I said, to protect the receptors who would otherwise be drinking groundwater that would be affected by dissolved phase PFAS. So I've deliberately allowed 10 or so minutes for questions. Um, I'm happy to take those questions either in the chat box or verbally, but I'm hoping that uh, Paolo will come and, uh, and moderate the question session. Thank you, Paul, for your presentation. Mm -hmm. It was a very interesting talk. Thank you so, so much. And now, uh, if someone has any question, please let us know and open your microphone. Uh, let me check if Paulo is here. Paulo, Hello, Sam? yes. Okay. Thank you. We would you. like to Thank introduce Paulo Sakaitano, who would moderate the questions. So let let's open up to the questions. Thank you so much. Paul. Thank you, Paul, for your fantastic talk. So clear and um, and instructive. It's... Thank you very much. Um, I haven't. There are no questions yet that have arrived through the uh, chat, but um, if anyone wants to put a question, they can probably put their hands up. They could also type it in the chat box if they want. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was checking that, but they are, okay. Please contact me, okay, you've, you put your your email address as well, so people can can follow. No questions. No questions. There are no doubts. <laughs> I've got one final slide I might show while people think of course, up some yes. questions, if I yeah, may. Yes. Of course, yes, yes. Uh, this please, is really my closing yeah. slide. Um, so at the beginning of the day, those of you who were uh, here would have heard from uh, Marco Falcone. Um, he and I are part of a team putting together a 24-hour sustainathon in September. Uh, and we're going around the world asking countries to tell us what are they doing that's really exciting in meeting the sustainable development goals, the, the 17 United Nations sustainable development goals. So if PFAS isn't your thing, but sustainable development goals are, please again get in touch because we're looking to have um, 24 sessions with three countries in each session telling us what's going on around the world. And Patricia is also part of that group. Uh, she's been one of the hosts for, uh, for this week as well. Um, Paolo, I'm gonna hand back to you and see if there were any questions coming through. Not really, no. I would like <laughs> I would like someone to, to to put their hands up or write something down on our, on our chat. Patricia, do you want to add anything to? It's time okay, for we have one yeah. one hand up. My my colleague Grasa Brito. Grasa, could, would you put your video on? Yes. Hi. Hey, Hi everyone. Hi Paul. Hi. Great Hello. presentation, Thank real you. great. <laughs> so we are processing the information, I think, but in my case, uh, 
sometimes when I'm doing risk analysis, uh, the problem is that some of these um, uh, compounds are not in the databases. So it's difficult to apply an equation. <laughs> and if we don't know exactly the um, uh, mobility uh, parameters and uh, the behavior of these chemicals, of these components, uh, it's difficult to make the risk assessments. And <laughs> so what do we do? Yes, what we do, that's the okay. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the answer is, um, I, I think I had a slide, which I might, I wonder if I deleted it. But let me see if I can find a slide to answer your question. It was about bows and arrows. I, 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 not, I'm, I live in Not Nottingham, the home of Robin Hood. I haven't got that slide with me. Okay. Um, if you don't know enough, then you can say the toxicity cannot be more than this or it has to be less than something else. A few years ago, we were part of a project looking at the use of nanoparticles uh, in groundwater remediation. And our role was to write a risk assessment protocol for brand new particles in order to satisfy regulators that by putting them into the groundwater, they wouldn't be posing a risk. And we needed to know fate, transport and toxicity. But it was too early in the project to have real laboratory data. So we ran an expert elicitation workshop where we got specialists in and said, OK, these are the these are the substances we want to put into the ground. What can we deduce? What can we work out about the most likely or the worst behavior of these chemicals? And then we could put that into our risk assessment. And we, we published this in a paper in the Journal of Remediation, if anybody's interested. Um, so I may not know the solubility of a chemical, but I may be able to say, well, from its chemical structure, it's similar to something else, and, and therefore it's going to be within an order of magnitude. So you're being much more cautious in your risk evaluation, do I need to remediate or don't I? Because you are using um, precautionary values, but that doesn't stop you being able to still work through that process of risk assessment. Hmm. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, but it's difficult to convince oh, yes. uh, regulators yes. that uh, this is a guess. I think that this chemical uh, maybe it has this behavior, but I have to prove it. And sometimes in this type of work, we, we do not have time to make research on that because it's not the research project. Absolutely. So, uh, so we, we, I think um, that we used to say that this to present the worst situation, the worst situation, which is not real. So... But, but yeah. we, can, we can perhaps do a little bit better than the worst situation. Yes. That's why I'm saying um, it's a bit better than a guess. It's an expert elicitation-based value. Okay. And, okay. And, and the, way to, the way to make sure that people are uh, comfortable with the, the process is by involving them in the process, either as participants or as observers if they don't want to take part. So full transparency, full honesty is an important um, cornerstone, an important principle in making sure that everybody is confident in the outcome of the process. Yes. And in the meantime, we're hoping the researchers are doing some clever research to solve the problem. Yes. Yes, that's it. That's the, the best uh, way to do it. Yes. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Graça. Um, Luan? We will speak in Portuguese just for a while, ok, Paul? Nathaniel, but please stay with us. Uh, pessoal, vocês que estão nos assistindo, se vocês quiserem fazer qualquer pergunta em português mesmo, vocês podem abrir seu vídeo, seu microfone, e o Paulo Sacaitano vai traduzir, então, para o Paul Nathaniel. Então, podem fazer, inclusive, as perguntas em português, tá certo? Se tiver mais alguém. Ok. 
Thank you, Lua. We have we have a question that okay. has been put by Bianca. Okay. Um, on the on the chat, Paul can. I'm just reading it. Okay. Have you been involved in any case where an error was remediated and afterwards the Environment Agency determined the need to investigate PFAS and reopen the case again? How mm. do you So the short answer to that is no, <laughs> but mm -hmm. how do you manage a case where you've had a site closure and emerging contaminants need to be investigated even if the site has a new land use, a new occupation? Uh, so no, we haven't had that case. Um, but I've had three cases recently where we asked for PFAS to be tested. The client initially was um, questioning why, and then said, OK, and we found PFAS in every case. Had we not done the testing, the PFAS would still have been there, and they would have had a problem down the line because they would have had a liability they were not aware of. The, the short answer of how do you manage that case is you, you're back at the beginning of that risk management process. The important thing, and this is where it becomes really interesting, is who is responsible for these emerging contaminants and the problems? And that will depend on which country you're in. So in the UK, if I buy land, it's up to me to find out what the state of the land is. The principle is caveat emptor, buyer beware. And if I ask the question, is there any PFAS on this land? And, and you, the seller, tells me no, then you retain the problem. But if I then take over the ownership, then it becomes my problem. But it depends then on the legal regime, the legal context that you are looking at that question through. So the answer may be different in Brazil than it is in England, for example. Where the site has a new land use, then that becomes even more interesting because you've got people on that land. And the real danger is if you've got an industrial site that's been finished and demolished and redeveloped for housing, and the new occupation is with, with young children there, and then the sensitivities are really high. Now, again, that's much of what we deal with under things like Part 2A of the Environmental Protection Act, where we go and look at the current land use and historic contamination. So the chemistry might be different, but the scenario is one that we have a lot of um, expertise with across the European contaminated land practitioner community. So Bianca, thank you. That's a really good question. If you've got a particular scenario in mind, then, then drop me an email and we can continue the conversation if you want. But thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bianca. Mais perguntas? Do you, do you more wish questions? To, <laughs> do you wish to ask anything else, Bianca? You put your camera on. Uh, no, no, thanks. Um, uh, and then it was a very good answer. Thank okay, you, Paul. Fine. fine, thank you. Any more questions? Any more hands up or any question, text in, in our chat? Lua, Let's do you, want to, do you mm -hmm. want to add anything? No. No? Just to thank, Just, okay. uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. Paul was absolutely nice and wonderful. And obrigada, Paulo. Thank you so much, Paulo, okay. for moderating the questions. Thank you, Paul, very much. Thank you okay, so, nice so to much. Meet you. Yes. Thank, thank you, Rasa. And thanks for the participants also, okay? Everyone on one line with the questions. Thanks so much. I will continue here, okay? <laughs> Right. Our day today brought extremely important themes to our area. We hope that they inspire and stimulate new actions and solutions also with a positive impact. Thanks again to everyone who presented us with their knowledge, research, case studies, and data. 
We also appreciate the participation of all of you who are following our meeting online. Tomorrow there is more and we hope to have you with us again. We remind you all that the complete program is available both on the CIGREC website, CIGREC2020.pt and on CIGREC stand at the virtual exhibition area. Reminding the virtual exhibition area is an innovation and a trend that translates into a huge opportunity for online and real-time networking and interaction. It will be open during this conference with a virtual stand of our sponsors who will be able to interact with the public interested either through online chat or virtual rooms. Please check the CIGREC program for more details on the virtual exhibition. And don't forget that we have some sponsors presentation on virtual fair. You can access sponsor room, check the schedule in our program. Once again, on behalf of CIGREC, we thank you all very much for your participation. Have an excellent evening or afternoon. See you tomorrow. Line, please. Bye bye.